Welcome to the Tom Golden Jr. Fellowship in Faith and Science. Before we begin, two of Tom's cousins are here, Justin and Matthew, and I'd like to invite Justin up to say a few words. Thank you. Welcome. This is the uh, 10th um, Fellowship in Faith and Science in Tom's memory, and we have a great speaker this evening, so enjoy and have some good conversation. Thank you. To introduce our speaker, Father Nicanor Ostriaco completed his bachelor's degree in bioengineering at the University of Penn and then earned his PhD in biology from MIT. During his time there, he was a fellow of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He was ordained a priest in the Order of Preachers, the Dominicans, in May of 2004. He completed his pontifical license in sacred theology and moral theology at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C., and a pontifical doctorate in sacred theology at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland in 2015. Father Ostriaco currently serves as a professor of biology and theology at Providence College in Rhode Island. His NIH-funded laboratory at Providence College is investigating the genetics of programmed cell death using yeasts as model organisms. He has published research and essays in both the science and theology fields. His first book, Biomedicine and Beatitude, An Introduction to Catholic Bioethics, was published by the Catholic University of America Press in 2011. It was recognized in 2012 as a choice outstanding academic title by the Association of College and Research Libraries. And it is tonight my pleasure to welcome him as a speaker for our annual fellowship in faith and science, which has been gifted to us as part of Tom Golden's fellowship. Welcome. Thank you very much um, to Sister Jen, my, my sister Dominican, for the wonderful welcome uh, to your community to talk about faith and science. And so this evening, I would like to talk about the hottest thing in molecular biology, which is CRISPR-Cas. And um, I'm going to try to bring the science and the ethics into conversation with each other using the Catholic tradition as a, a, a conversation partner. And so my, my lecture this evening is going to be divided into three parts. First, I'm going to give you an introduction to the biology of genome editing with CRISPR. I'm not quite sure how many of you here are biologists or working in biology. Any biologists here? So that's very cool. And I apologize for the simplicity of the presentation. I'm going to just give uh, the, the kind of like the in big brush strokes, in large brush strokes, exactly what CRISPR is all about. And then I'm going to move to human dignity and the ethics of genome editing. The numbers are weird because I did this on a Mac, and whenever I put it on a PC, the numbers get strange. So we're going to talk about human dignity and the ethics of genome editing as an introduction to Catholic bioethics. Because in many ways, when I do Catholic bioethics and I teach Catholic bioethics at Providence College, a lot of my students will ask me, what's the foundational principle for Catholic bioethics? And at the end of the day, it's going to be human dignity. And then I'm going to end with a discussion using a very common discussion, so a distinction. So today, if you talk about gene editing, both in the Catholic as well as the secular communities, you're going to get this distinction between therapy and enhancement. And so often, outside the church and in the church, there's this belief that therapy is good, enhancement is not so good. And what I'd like to end up this lecture on this, this, this evening is to really challenge that distinction to explore whether or not it's a robust one. So the first thing is genome editing with CRISPR. And so I'm going to begin with the genome. And so this is the genome. It's all the information encoded in the DNA of an organism. And so the prim primary source for the, the genome is the nuclear genome. This is the nucleus. This is the, the um, control center of the cell. And these are the chromosomes that make up most of the, of the DNA in the cell, and therefore the genome. What most people don't, who are non-biologists don't realize is that there, are, there is another part of the cell called the mitochondria. It's the factory, the energy factory of the cell. It's the part of the cell that makes energy. And this 
Organelle, little organ, also has a genome. It's called the mitochondrial genome. Now, what's interesting about this genome is that this is the genome that we, we inherit. All of us have inherited this genome from our mothers. And so there is enormous amount of interest in this. For example, if you compare the genomes of individuals scattered from all over the planet, you discovered that every single individual who, who is currently living is descended from a single female who lived about 150,000 years ago. Now, one of the things I point out is that this doesn't mean she was the only female living at that time. So that's a very interesting observation, especially since other things that I deal with in, involve things like Adam and Eve, and how do we, as how, how does a Catholic theologian, how does a Catholic believer read Genesis in light of the paleogenomic data that we have today? So now if you take a chromosome, so this is one of those chromosomes, what's really striking about the chromosome, about the DNA that you have, is that if you take out all the DNA from a single cell, one of your single cells, and you stretch it out, it, go, it stretches out to about seven feet, two meters long. And yet the largest cell in the body is the human egg cell, and that cell is equivalent to the period at the end of a time, New, Times Roman, New Times Roman, a 12 font sentence. And that's the largest cell, that's the period right there. And so one of the great mysteries of contemporary biology is how do you take seven meters of spaghetti and basically wrap it up in such a way that you can squeeze it into a cell that is the size of a period at the end of a sentence and in, in such an organized fashion that you can access the information when you need it and as soon as you need it. And so this DNA is actually organized at different levels of organization. All I'm gonna show right now is that if you take one of these chromosomes and you stretch them out, you end up having a single linear DNA molecule. And this is the famous double helix that pretty much everyone associates with contemporary uh, molecular biology today. But if you take DNA, and a lot of, of, of when I go and speak at non-scientific locations and they say, well, what exactly is DNA? Well, DNA looks like that. So this is actually the gene that my students and I discovered. We currently are studying this gene. This is a gene yeast Bax inhibitor. It's the homologue. It's the yeast version of a gene that is found in you and me that has been linked to kidney cancer, to prostate cancer, to breast cancer, and to certain forms of brain cancers called gliomas. And um, my students and I are trying to figure out what this gene encodes. It actually, uh, we now think, uh, based on the data that I just received from my students this afternoon, because they've been working uh, all weekend, we pretty much have data now that shows that the protein that this gene encodes for is a pH-sensitive calcium channel. And um, one of the things you, you should know is that when this gene is overexpressed, cancer results. So one of the things we're trying to figure out is we're gonna to try to figure out how to, this is a channel, so it's basically a hole, a pore. And what we're trying to do now is that my students and I are trying to figure out if we can identify drugs that can plug up that pore, you know, give that protein constipation so that calcium won't leak out in the way that it would, uh, giving rise to cancer. But what I wanted you to take from this slide is that DNA is information, and it's information that is modeled, in this case, by a sequence of letters. And there, each of these letters, there are four letters, G, A, T, C. Each one of these letters represents a particular molecule, a nucleotide, and DNA is just a string of these nucleotides. And each one of us, a, a typical human genome is about three billion of these letters. And there are, if you, if you think of a, of a gene as a word, there are approximately 20,000 words in your genome where each word is a gene. Now what is really striking today in the post-genomic era is that there are organisms that have more genes than we do. For example, rice has 50,000 genes, and yet rice has never been to the moon. And so one of the most striking challenges of contemporary biology is how to explain the complexity of you and me. For a long time it was thought, well, the more complex organisms simply have more genes. We now know that's not the case. We have just as many genes as uh, a worm. Or a f uh, so, so, and again, like I said, worms have never composed a symphony.
And so, so much of biology is going from a reductionist account of the human organism to a more holistic uh, vision of what it means to be a human being. Now, if you imagine that your genome is three billion of these bases, then at the end of the day, CRISPR is a molecular editing machine. It allows us to edit those letters in a very precise way. And this is just a schematic of the molecule. So what you end up, so this is the gene of interest. So let's say this is a word. If your genome is modeled as an encyclopedia, this is a word in that encyclopedia. And what you have is you've got this protein called Cas9. And Cas9 pairs up with, this is called a guide RNA. And as you'll see in a couple of slides, these two together are able to, ident to, to target to a particular word in your encyclopedia and then alter that word in such a way that we can change a single letter. We can change a period to an exclamation point, for example. And the editing is incredibly precise in a way that we had not experienced prior to 2012. And these are some of the different things that people are doing today with this very simple molecular editing machine. This is just what it really looks like. So this is a, it's called the crystal structure of the molecule. And so here you have the DNA and you have the RNA guide. I'm sorry, yeah, the RNA guide. And this blue thing here is actually the Cas9 protein. And so this is a snapshot of this, in, this incredibly complicated, well, not really complicated, but amazing molecular editing machine. Now, this is how it works. So what you do is you need this guide DNA, and the guide DNA is what targets the machine. So here's the CRISPR tool, this yellow blob. And the yellow blob binds up with this guide RNA. And together, what they do is that they find and identify the target gene in your encyclopedia that is your genome. And then using in mechanisms, which I'm not gonna have a chance to get into, what it's able to do is it's able to cut the DNA in a precise location, and then we are able to provide whatever p a piece of new DNA to, to radically alter and modify that genetic location. Now, you'll, you'll wonder where is CRISPR from? It turns out that CRISPR is actually the bacterial cell's immune system. So you and I have an immune system. When we get a shot, basically what ends up happening is our body adapts to the virus or whatever is antigen we injected into ourselves. An antigen is a part of the pathogen that our immune system recognizes. And whenever you get a flu shot, basically what happens is we introduce parts of what we think will be this season's most prevalent flu strains. Now, it turns out that bacteria, the simple bacteria that uh, float around in the, in, in the environment, also have this very rudimentary immune system. So here you have a, a virus. This is a phage. This is a bacterial virus. And what it does is that it injects its own DNA, which is foreign. It's foreign DNA. And if the bacteria is able to survive this infection, what it does is it remembers that DNA. And the way it remembers this invader's DNA is it inserts that DNA into what is called the CRISPR locus. It turns out what happens is that the next time one of these viruses injects, tries to inject its DNA, the CRISPR machine takes the memor memorize or remember DNA and uses it to attack the incoming viral DNA. And so the cell is able to protect itself from invading viruses. What we have done is we've simply taken this machine and we've, we've altered it in such a way that we can use it as an editing tool in all sorts of cool ways. So, CRISPR was pretty much described about five years ago, and this is just a highlight of some of the things we've done with CRISPR. So for example, um, we've, we were able to engineer zebrafish. So zebrafish are the Rio Danio zebrafish that you can buy at your, 
at your local pet store for a buck. And it's a common model organism for vertebrates. And we were able to use CRISPR to edit the genes in zebrafish. We've been able to engineer and edit the genes for in monkeys. These are macaques. And I'm now going to go over some of the things that we've done in more detail leading up to editing of the human genome. So this was done a few years ago. It's been used to correct genetic mutations in the liver of mice. Now, why mice? Because these mice are models of a human hereditary disease. And in this particular situation, there's a mutation in a gene, uh, which is called FAH. We don't need to talk about what it does. But when you have a mutation in the gene FAH, you have an accumulation, a deleterious accumulation of tyrosine in your blood. And so what we've done is we've generated a mouse that basically looks like a, a very sick kid. And what they were able to do is they were able to inject CRISPR-Cas, this molecular editing machine, into the livers of living mice. And the correction was able to the correction was successful, successful enough that the livers of the mice post-molecular surgery uh, was such that the disease phenotype, the symptoms, were, were relieved significantly. So this is a proof of principle that you can do this sort of thing in mammal cell, mammalian cells, in animals, where you can take a bacterial genetic machine and put it into an animal. So we've also been able to edit animal populations. So think here of malaria. This is called a gene drive. So the idea here is, let's say we wanted to get rid of an entire species of mosquito, say the mosquito that is the carrier for the malaria pathogen. So what you can do is you can actually alter the genomes of these mosquitoes, release them into the wild, and alter the entire population. So let me just try to outline what's going on here. So this is normal inheritance. Here's uh, daddy mosquito and mommy mosquito. And this daddy mosquito is genetically altered. And the way it usually goes is that half 50% of the, of the progeny of the children inherit the genetic change that you introduced. What's interesting is using CRISPR-Cas, we've been able to alter the genetic pedigree, the genetic inheritance of the mutation. So what happens here is that you have a gene drive. So this is the daddy mosquito with the mutation that you have that basically makes um, the female sterile, for example. You made it to a wild type. Now what usually happens here is that you've got a normal copy and then you, I'm sorry, you have a normal copy here and then the blue copy is the, the altered edited version. But what you can do here is that this blue copy will, using CRISPR-Cas, change the other version, the one inherited from the female, and make that into a copy of itself. And using this genetic mechanism, what you can see in a very short period of time, you can actually have the entire population of organisms mutated in the way that you want it to be mutated in. Now, with humans, with humans, this is, there are two different approaches to using CRISPR-Cas. So one is called in vivo editing, and this is very similar to the mouse experiments that I just mentioned. What you do is you take CRISPR-Cas using the correct guide RNA targeting the correct gene that you want to change. You use um, some viral or, or non-viral delivery and introduce that into the patient. And the idea is that just like we saw in the mouse, what would actually happen is that these, this genetic machine would alter the genetics of the cells of the patient. This is in vivo editing. We also have what's called ex vivo editing, and for, for many reasons, this is considered the preferred version at the moment. What you do is you take cells out from the patient, usually stem cells, and then you use CRISPR-Cas to edit those stem cells, make sure those stem cells were edited in the exact right way that you want, and then you introduce those cells back into the patient, and they will be able to regenerate, recover, or repair whatever organ or organ system or tissue had been damaged that led to disease. Now this is uh, to give you an example of this, a very specific example, we have sickle cell disease. So what happens here is you have 
a blood stem cell with a single mutation, GTG. Remember, there's G, A, T, C are the four letters. So this is a three letters of the three billion letters of the genome. And because there's a single T rather than an A, so the A is normal, the T is mutant, what actually happens is you have the formation of sickle cell cells and with an enormous number of, of, of negative symptoms. So what we do now is that, and this has been done in principle, is that they've taken stem cells from an individual who has sickle cell disease. Using CRISPR-Cas, we edit GTG to GAG. And in principle, we've not done this yet, we would take these stem cells, replace the disease stem cells in the, in the patient's bones, and you would basically cure the patient of sickle cell anemia. So we've, we've been able to go up to here, and um, the FDA uh, and the CDC and all sorts of clinical trials have to happen before you can go from this step to that step. But they've taken this and put it into mice, and they've shown that you've been able to regenerate and rejuvenate the mouse's humanized blood system, suggesting that in principle, once we do this with patients, you could technically cure patients of sickle cell anemia. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, CRISPR was used in China for the first time to edit human embryos, and it was a complex experiment. These were uh, allegedly non-normal humans because they had three, they, they, their nucleus had three copies of the genes, uh, what where you and I usually have two copies of every gene. Nonetheless, you should know that in this country there is a moratorium at the moment on using CRISPR for the, the editing of human genome, of the human genomes in human embryos. All right, so how do we deal with the ethics of this technology? Hopefully you, I have shown you, I have, I have lit up your imagination for how we could go ahead and use this type of technology to basically edit anything. And there, it's really, in one sense it's striking because you could do this you could do this in your garage. And there are now companies, you can go online and order the parts of the machine that you want, and it's like a $99 on sale, and you can just go ahead and buy these things. And if you have some basic knowledge and you set up a nice little lab laboratory in your lab, in your garage, you can go ahead and, and introduce the different pieces into your cat or any living organism to try to alter their genome. It's really striking, because right now you can go online and um, there are companies that are selling these kits to alter yeast. My, my favorite organism, which is why this is the yeast cell, by the way. Um, my favorite organism, second favorite, human beings the first, but second favorite or living organism. Um, and there are kits where high school students are using these molecular tools to edit the genomes of yeast. And so, I, if you're, if, I mean, bootstrapped organisms, we're talking about that in the next 10 years. So we're now talking about the ethics, what can and cannot do, and as I suggested to you, the foundational principle from the Catholic tradition is human dignity. And so this is a quote from Pope Francis, human dignity is the same for all human beings. When I trample on the dignity of another, I am trampling on my own. If you look at Pope Benedict, he says, every human life is precious in God's sight, and no effort should be spared in the attempt to promote throughout the world a genuine respect for the inalienable rights and dignity of individuals and peoples everywhere. Now, if you think this is just a Catholic thing, I just took a quote from Angela Mark Mer Merkel. Now, it's really interesting because the very first statement in the, in the German constitution, uh, the Grundgesetz, basically states that the fundamental role, role task of the German state is to protect human dignity. And it's not surprising, this, this uh, constitution was, was written in 1945, right after the horrors of the Nazi period. And so from the very beginning, the German people state it is human dignity that the government's all about. Now what's here is a striking thing, what is it? If I ask you what human dignity is, and I've asked my students this, they get flummoxed. They get really confused. I'm like, 
They're not really sure. And so we need to have a very clear account of what at least the Catholic tradition means by human dignity, because I, as I'm going to suggest, there is confusion today about what human dignity is, which is why we have so many disagreements in the moral sphere as to what is proper and improper human behavior. And to do that, I have to ask you this question, how much are you worth? Now, I tell my students this, and they go, they're trying to calculate. Right? They're trying to calculate. And so I say, how much is an iPhone 7 worth? So I'm going to help them out. You know, and they go, mm, that's easy. So they'll say, and what will happen is that if you look, they'll quote you $649 because they'll, they'll Google it. They'll look for the manufacturer's retail price. And they'll say, well, iPhone 7, 38, you know, gigs, 649. And I go, that's the price. So what's actually interesting is if I ask how much is it worth, we automatically equate worth to price. Now it's striking because I also asked, well, how much does it cost to manufacture an iPhone? And I looked it up, and there are people, it's $217.80 in today's dollars. So you notice there's an intrinsic versus intrinsic value for this iPhone. This is the extrinsic value. This is the price. This is, and honestly, what actually happens is you can negotiate this. We do that all the time. Amazon will cut it back a certain time. So you can do all sorts of this. But this one, this one, this is the value of the thing. And I'm taking a finance class this semester because last year I was at the Vatican and ended up having to talk to all these CEOs and CEOs about, CFOs and CEOs about, uh, the morality of stem cell research, and I realized they were speaking a different language than me, the language of money. And I said, well, I'm a Dominican. I'm a geek for God. I need to learn this language so I can preach the gospel. So I'm making finance. And one of the things I've discovered is that e this difference between intrinsic and extrinsic values all over, say, stocks. And you're trying to determine the intrinsic value of stock. And, you're, and of course, in a, per in a perfectly efficient market, what will happen is the extrinsic value, which is the market value of the stock, will equate the intrinsic value. And what analysts are always trying to do is they're trying to figure out if there's a difference between that and to, and to advise their clients as to whether or not they should sell or buy. So you see, this is a common, common principle, intrinsic versus intri extrinsic value. And so you have the intrinsic values of stock's true value. And as one of the things that I'm learning is that this is secret. This is what the inside people know. And the extrinsic value is in a perfectly efficient market, it's reflected in the market price. And you're trying to figure out the two. Now, here's the thing, right? What the Catholic tradition wishes to affirm is that you and I also have an intrinsic dignity and an extrinsic one. You see, this is the, this is the, this is the heart of the Catholic tradition's claim on your worth. There is an intrinsic dignity, which is the inherent worth of the human person. And there's the extrinsic dignity, the social worth. And my students say, oh, yeah, this is the salary. Right? So if I ask you how much you are worth, and if you Google how much is so-and-so worth, they will calculate the salary of the entire, uh, how much financially you're worth. Now, what's interesting is that this is Pope Francis. He says, things have a price and can be for sale. But people have a dignity. And this is really interesting because my student, when I say, how much are you worth? They'll be thinking for a while. Then one of them will say, Father, my mother says I'm priceless. <laughs> and that's the intuition. You see, the intuition is that you and I are priceless. And that our intrinsic worth is priceless. There is an extrinsic worth that could be tagged or labeled, and we, this is done all throughout our lives, right? And, and, but the idea here is that at the end of the day, and this is what M Mother Teresa will say, right, is that the poor have just as much worth as Bill Gates because their intrinsic dignity is the same. Now, here is the striking claim. I grew up in... in uh, a Buddhist country. I'm a Filipino by birth, but I grew up in Bangkok, Thailand. And one of the striking things about growing up in a non-Christian country is when you discover 
that the account of intrinsic dignity is so radically linked to the Christian claim that we are made in the image and likeness of God that non-Christians struggle with that. You know, when I was dating a Buddhist girl, this is a long time ago, way before I knew that the Lord was calling me to the priesthood, um, one of the things, because Buddhism has an account of reincarnation where you could become a mosquito, the, the value, you see, so you go, well, you know, I obviously can smack a mosquito when the mosquito is attacking me. So if I can attack that mosquito and kill it, then that, the value of that mosquito must be less than my value. But if that could have been my great-great-grandfather, then you see the notion of intrinsic dignity, the intrinsic worth of the human person begins to be blurred. And either two things happen. Either the animal is brought up or the human being is brought down. And so there is an account where the difference between the two, the value is, uh, between the two is, is, is blurred. And we are now approaching that sort of quandary in human society. So you have individuals who want to claim that certain organisms, for example, monkeys and dolphins, have dignity in the way that you and I have dignity, right? Or there are others who say that we can do things to, uh, to other human beings that we can do to animals. So for example, this week my students and I are talking about euthanasia. And it is very striking and very ironic that the euthanasia physician-assisted uh, physician suicide movement in our country is a de death with dignity. Now, what they're talking about there is the ex extrinsic dignity that you can gain or lose. So when someone is shamed, they lose some worth in the sight of others. That's extrinsic dignity. But the fundamental claim, the fundamental Christian claim, and I would say this is of all, true of all the Abrahamic religions, is that there is something that is different about you and me, such that our dignity is priceless, number one, this intrinsic component, and it's the source of our equality. So I always ask my students, why are we all equal? What makes us equal? For every single characteristic, there's always someone who have, will have more of it or less of it than you. Some of you are smarter than others. Some of you are more beautiful than others. Some of you are taller than others. There is no one characteristic that is equal amongst all of us. And yet, and yet we are convicted that all of us are equal. Now this is actually, uh, in a sense, a remnant in a post-Christian society of the Christian claim that we are made in the image and likeness of God. And you saw that, you see that here with Mother Teresa's uh, affirmation that the poor are just as equal as you and me, regardless of whatever deficits they may have, financially, personally, psychologically, emotionally, whatever it is. And part of the struggle we have in our society is we're not quite sure why we're equal anymore. And when I go out and have debates over bioethics or have conversations with, with individuals coming from different traditions, it's becoming more and more difficult to figure out what we have in common. So I've had people say, well, we're smart, we're intelligent. And I said, from a biological perspective, smart only helps in cities. If I took you and I put you in the middle of the tundra, I would rather be a wolf than a human being. Because smartness, thought, is adaptive only in particular environments. So it's very interesting to say that just because we're smart, we're better than wolves. I don't think so. The wolf wouldn't... Now, if you took the wolf and you put him in the middle of New Haven, he'd die. But if you took you and put you in the middle of the tundra, you'd die too, pretty much, unless you had a cell phone, you call everyone up. But you see what happens, <laughs> but you see from the biological perspective, there is no reason to think that cognitive ability, the ability to know and love, is in any way superior to these other traits that other organisms have, unless you think we're made in the image and likeness of God. Because then the reason why the ability to know and the ability to love are cooler than to be a wolf is because we are more godlike in having those abilities. And, and in a post-Christian secularized society, we struggle with these notions, which we think are deeply liberal, as in from the liberal tradition, and yet they're also deeply Christian. And I figured this out growing up in a non-Christian society because the presuppositions are so different. As I suggested to you, for many people, 
um, in growing up in, for many people in Thailand, a, a monkey, a mosquito, a cockroach is worth just as much as you and I are. Much, just as much as you and I are worth. And, you, and one of the difficulties of, of doing science in a Buddhist culture I discovered is that when the fly or the yeast cell has just as much, much, much dignity, it's very hard to kill them in good conscience in the way that my students do by the, by the trillions every day. And so here, one of the things I want to suggest to you is that at the end of the day, Catholic bioethics is grounded upon this fundamental principle that human, dignity, that human actions need to protect, preserve, and advance both intrinsic and extrinsic dignity. Many of our, my colleagues who, are, who come from a secular bent, they will equate human dignity to only extrinsic dignity, which is why they will say that when you lose the ability to choose, um, you lose your dignity. If you, have, you become solely dependent on a loved one, you lose your dignity. And so there's a claim that you can lose it. The Catholic tradition will, again, coming from, uh, from the account that you and I are imago dei, images of God, will claim that there's both. So, what, so when you're talking about something like human genome editing, the, uh, from a Catholic perspective, the question you have to ask is whether or not human genome editing will protect and advance the dignity of the human person. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of the concerns that are being raised. One is human safety. A thing, one of the things that I didn't, didn't talk about is how CRISPR, just like any editing machine, uh, is not 100% perfect. There are what are called off-targets, uh, off-target changes. But what's very clear is that this is a problem that will be surmountable in the next couple of years. They're able to genetically engineer more and more and more precise um, machines that will go in there and change it in only one way. There's the concern that the person will be objectified. And what I mean here is that when we, so uh, one of the striking things when I teach bioethics to my students at Providence College is I say that if you look at every single social or ethical concern where the Catholic Church is, is opposed to something, you will discover that that, that that act or that practice is in some way undermining human dignity. Take the very controversial topic of abortion. So I am a Project Rachel priest. I have the privilege of accompanying women and men who struggle with the after effects of abortion. And this happens many, many years in advance. So it's very striking because if you look up the papers today and you look at abortion regret, uh, the, the, the numbers, the published numbers say it's only about 1% of women uh, regret having abortions. Now I go, this is very surprising because there was a paper, there was, there was a study done by, I can't remember which insurance company, and they showed that 70% of car buyers regret their car purchase in some way. And as I tell people, isn't it interesting that, that the, the data suggests that women, only 1% of women regret having abortion? And regardless of where you stand on the abortion issue, you know this is an incredibly traumatic, difficult decision. And yet, first-time car owners, 70%. And the same numbers happen again across the board. It turns out that we are human, human beings are built for regret. So if you look in the United Kingdom, there was a study, how many people regret cosmetic surgery? 70%. And it turns out the way that you resolve that issue is that when I've been working with these women who struggle with abortion regret, it actually happens long after the abortion the initial response is one of relief. It's one of incredible relief. But usually what happens in the long run is that regret occurs the second or third time um, a pregnancy happens. And as a woman explained this to me, you know, when she, 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 was, she came in to talk to me, she says, look, this is what happened. You know, my second child, we decided to get the, the speakers for the baby bump because we wanted to play Beethoven because we had read online that Beethoven played on the uterus is great for the kid. So uh, we, we, I didn't realize that you can now get these incredible contraptions. You attach them around the woman's belly, and then they can play Beethoven's uh, symphonies directly into the, into the uterus. And she said, you know, this is what happened. She said, we were playing Beethoven into my uterus, and my husband was sitting there 
cooing away and talking. To, and then I said, but what's different between this and what happened 12 years ago or 16 years ago? And that, that cognitive dissonance leads to issues. And that's when I get a chance to talk to them and just accompany them and walk with them. Now, one of the things I, I point out that with abortion, one of the problems with abortion, and there are many, many issues, both, and you, we can argue this left and right, but one of the problems with abortion is that it places a price on the fetal life. And my students say, what is that price? It's the woman's choice. You see, and this is part of the difficulty. Part of the difficulty is that um, when you and I are priceless, any, any practice that leads to putting a price on you or me is going to be problematic in the, in, from, the site, in the, from the perspective of the Catholic moral tradition. Like selling and buying human organs, for example. This is a problem. It's a problem in my part of the world where my parents live because the poorest of the poor are the ones who sell their kidneys. And so you have an objectification and exploitation of the poor because monetary value is being placed on human beings that are inherently priceless. And so the concern is that if we allow the genome editing of children, so this is particularly with children, what actually happens is the child becomes an object of manipulation and a and that person is commodified. Okay, I give them an example. So you say what happens if you wanted to make, you want your kid to be a basketball player. So now you, what you do is you alter all of the kid's genes so the kid is, has the, the traits that are perfect for a basketball player. Now, the kid decides, I want to be a pianist. This is going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem because what actually happens, and this is called the open future argument, one of the great adventures of human life is that you and I have the privilege of figuring out what God wants us to do. But once you have the human, a human person basically editing and making a human being, not in the image of God, but in the image of their desires, you end up limiting their life and their future, and this generates a lot of issues. We see this now where parents say, I want you to be a doctor. And the kid comes to me and says, I don't want to be a doctor. I want to write books. And so you see this kind, and this, the concern here is that, that CRISPR-Cas could lead to the objectification of persons, making them the object of the desire of another. There is the concern that there will be a marginalization of peoples. There will be those who can get edited and those who can't. And I had a student once tell me, you know, Father, in a few generations, you'll be able to tell the Catholics, they'll be the ugly ones. <laughs> because all the beautiful people will be genetically edited to be gorgeous. Now, it's really interesting. I mean, that's, you know, he was just saying that because he figured out, you know, he was thinking this. But what happens, you see, is if you're not careful, you actually divide the human population into those that are edited and those who don't, who can't be edited. And this is this concern of equal access. So the poor will not be able to be edited, but the rich will be. And the idea is that the social injustices that are already present could be magnified. And so these are just some of the concerns that have been raised. There are no answers yet. I'm just beginning to lay out the land. Um, what's really striking is that uh, the ethics is the papers that are, that are coming out to discuss the ethics of this issue are, just be, are still in press. Now I'm going to end with this distinction, therapy versus enhancement. So a lot of people simply say, well, we should be able to use therapy, but we should not be able to use enhancement. And this is uh, Dignitas Personae. So this is a document from the Vatican Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. This is the congregation. This is the the branch of the Catholic Church that deals with doctrinal issues. And this is the most recent bioethics uh, instruction. And what, is, what happens here is there is a distinction made between therapy and enhancement. So therapy is defined this way. So therapy is actions that seek to restore the normal genetic configuration of the patient or to counter damage caused by genetic anomalies or those related to other pathologies. And there's an account here 
that these therapies are legit. And then in contrast to therapies, you have what are called genetic engineering for purposes other than medical treatment, the other. And the concern here is improving, improving and strengthening the gene pool. This is the enhancement category. And um, what I've done, and I really try to see is how robust is this distinction? Can we use this distinction to help us think through CRISPR-Cas genome editing? And I'm going to suggest that it's not. And I'm going to use a very common example to illustrate my point. And the point is this, cholesterol. So if I ask, what should the target LDL levels be for patients at risk for cardiovascular disease? And if I ask the population, there's a few of us here on statins, I'm pretty sure. That's just the way it works. Statins is a drug, first described in yeast, yes. Um, that is now prescribed for millions of Americans, millions of people throughout the world, to lower their LDL. This is the bad cholesterol. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the average levels of bad cholesterol amongst U.S. adults, the average between 20 to 74 is 119 milligrams per deciliter, and the normal range is 90 to 130. So that's basically, if you want to go, what's species normative, this is it. Now, you go, what are the recommended targets for LDL levels? So if you just go online and you go, what should I be targeting in terms of really good LDL? It turns out the optimal is less than 100. And the idea is that well, by the time you get to 130, 159, the doctor is going to get concerned. Now. If you look at hunter-gatherer tribes, so these are human beings who live in very, very rural areas, say in Papua New Guinea, uh, the boondocks. If you look at their LDL levels, it's 70 milligrams per deciliter. And if you look at non-human primates, so baboons, it's 30 to 50 milligrams per deciliter. Now, there's even one striking patient who has a mutation in this gene. You don't have to worry about the gene. But I'm telling you that what they showed is that his LDL levels is 15 milligrams per deciliter, and he is healthy as anything. So now we have a question. So what should the target be? Right? Now, if you look, if you look, it turns out if you, if you say that therapy returns the patient to the spe species norm, then we have to target between 70 to 130 milligrams per deciliter, because this is the normal range. But you can look at the literature, just put on PubMed and Google, well, the Google, the PubMed, I guess. And what you do is you notice that studies have shown that the lower the levels of LDL, the better. And in fact, there are many, many cardiologists out there who are now saying that we should go to 50 or lower milligrams per deciliter. Remember, the normal range is 70 to 130. We're going outside that range. We're making you and me like baboons. We are enhancing our blood system. But we're enhancing our blood system for therapeutic reasons. You see? And we can, we can basically, right, what I'd like to argue is that this is a legitimate use of technology to lower the LDL levels even beyond the species norm to preserve and protect human health. This is therapeutic, right? But if this is therapeutic, and I've, this, I've made this argument, then the distinction between therapy and enhancement is not a robust one because there are therapeutic enhancements where you, you use, where you alter the, 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 the genes so that the patient is beyond the species norm but it's therapeutic in that it preserves and protects his health. And I've argued that this, in fact, is licit, and this is morally a good thing. And if this is the case, we can do things like genetic immunizations. So we are trying to develop a vaccine against HIV AIDS. This is one of the big challenges of immunologists. But it turns out that there are patients that carry mutation CCR5 Delta 32 who are normally resistant to HIV AIDS. HIV, they can become HIV positive, but they, that will never progress the disease. So they actually have a natural resistance to HIV. So the question is, can we go ahead and use CRISPR-Cas 
to alter the genes of the blood, reintroduce these blood genes into the patient, basically remove them from the species norm and make all of us uh, immunize as their genetic immunizations against HIV AIDS. Now, cancer is a big thing. My lab is working on cancer. It turns out elephants don't get cancer. It's a great mystery. It was a great mystery until a couple of months ago where they figured out that elephants have extra copies of this gene called P53. You and I have two copies, they have 10. And we now know that the more copies you have of this, the more resistant you are to cancer. So here's the question. Can we just introduce extra copies of this gene into the human genome and immunize you against cancer? You will never get cancer. None of your children will ever get cancer. We can actually eradicate cancer from the, from the planet in the way that we've been able to remove polio. See, this is the kind of questions that I am raising. This is the kind of questions that we're, our society as a whole has to debate. So in conclusion, uh, what I hope that I've been able to, to share with you is that we're on the verge of a genetic revolution in science and medicine. There will be a Nobel Prize given for CRISPR, if not this year, in the next couple of years. Um, bioethics, especially Catholic bioethics, the fundamental principle is to preserve, protect, and advance human dignity. If there's any practice that makes, that reduces the, the person to an object, especially an object that you, you've tagged with some price, there's gonna be a problem with that. And that therapeutic enhancements to preserve human health should be morally licit. And this is kind of like a proposal. We're not quite sure where this is yet. We're just gonna, as all scholars do, argue it out. And because I'm a Catholic theologian, submit it to discernment by the Holy Spirit in the church. So we'll see how that goes. So acknowledgments. Um, this is my laboratory. <laughs> And um, I always thank them, first of all, because they're the ones who raise all the questions late at night while we're running gels and transforming cells. They're like, Father, CRISPR, what should we do with that? And I go, okay, let me think about that. And we sit there and argue over all sorts of things. This is the great thing about a, a I, I was trained in very large research universities. I went to the University of Pennsylvania as an undergrad and did my PhD at MIT, and I never knew that, the, that you could have a, this, this kind of relationship with an, as an undergrad. Because my laboratory um, is an undergraduate laboratory. I've had two postdocs. I've discovered I prefer undergrads to postdocs, many reasons for that. Um, <laughs> so, and so I'm now investing my NIH funds primarily into undergrads and research techs rather than postdocs. One of the difficulties that postdocs don't understand how undergrad laboratories work, and they're, they struggle with, with the pace, you know? You, have, you learn patience doing science in an undergraduate laboratory. Um, but they've been an amazing blessing for me and for my intellectual development. And then because I'm a molecular biologist, I have to thank the people who give the money for the laboratory that allows me to do what we are able to do. Thank you very much. I apologize, I'm a little over, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Um, yes. One of the struggles we have in the Connecticut Medicaid program with limited dollars and many more genetic tests to order for patients is, as you pointed out, the technology to get those letter sequences is perfect almost. Even the technology to say those pairings of genes to say which diseases they represent is perfect. But then many companies stop there and market all these tests without proving that doing or not doing the test makes a difference in the outcome. So for example, your, your statin thing, th that uh, whole National Cholesterol Project was funded by a group of people who mostly are on the boards of all the statin companies. And if they would, they would put statins in the drinking water. The CRISPR stuff is amazing, and I certainly agree with exploring it to treat diseases. My fear is that the, the medical industrial complex and the for-profit mentality will say, well, let's do this as quickly as we can, rush it to market, and not prove the outcomes or, or show that there is outcome improvement. What's your sense about that? Um, I think one of, the, so one of the striking things that I've noticed in molecular biology these days is that many of my classmates are now founders of companies. 
Uh, they got their PhDs with me, and they're now founders of companies. And when I've talked to them about science, I've discovered that because of the for-profit mentality, there's been a change in the way we can talk about science because the lawyers control everything. Um, they're not able to tell me things that they would have told me in the past. So, I, and what I've learned from interacting with them, thank God I have a vow of poverty. So, that's just, it's a, it's a no, th it, it doesn't even, yeah. But, and they, it's really striking because I have a vow of poverty um, and they know that I won't be, money, there's just, I can never have a, I can never benefit from, from they're, they're willing to be honest about their struggles, and the struggle primarily is that there's enormous amount of pressure uh, to, well, to increase the value of stock or to make your company, your startup so attractive that some other large pharma, big, big industry is going to buy you up for a huge profit. So I, I agree that your, your, your concern is a real one. It, the difficulty is that it's not just that it shows efficacy, but the efficacy in which populations, yeah. right? So one of the things is that this mutation may be good in a particular population of individuals, but it may not be so good in another population. And it's only extensive studies that will allow us to do this, but these, these studies are expensive. And a lot of people will say they're, well, they're not profitable. And I, and I would be concerned for that if, if that became the driving force for, for the ethical as well as the scientific paradigm surrounding CRISPR-Cas. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? There was a question back there. Yep. I'm on, interested in knowing whether National Institute of Health has um, guidelines for how you would be delivering your treatment and how informed the patients need to be about the efficacy of doing these things and will your to the best of my knowledge as of today yes. the NIH has not yet published any definitive guidelines however mm -hmm. um, the national academies had a meeting last summer where they invited scientists to get together to try to articulate, and this was um, David Baltimore at uh, Caltech was, um, was in charge of this, to articulate some of the guiding principles uh, to help us to discern the ethical landscape ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And that document was published a month ago. And the Nuffield Bioethics Council, which is one of the pre uh, preeminent bioethics councils in the United Kingdom also in the last few months published proposed guidelines to, to, to help us maneuver through this landscape. The Catholic Church is in the process of doing the same thing. So the NIH has not yet come out, but there are already some, there are hints of where it's going to go. Thank, Thank you, you very much. of tumor suppressor gene. P53. Will eliminate malignancy? Well, I mean, in theory, that's supposed to happen, right? And um, I, I haven't checked on PubMed if we've been able to do that in animals, I mean, in, in, in mice yet. The paper that showed that, um, that elephants had 10. And, and there are, actually, I'll take that back. There are a couple of papers that already suggest that I believe in mouse models, increasing the copy number of P53 will decrease um, the incidence of cancer. But I can't quote chapter and verse on that. But decreasing is very different than eliminating. Sure. But the idea, I think, is that if you have to mutate P53 and a significant number of cancers, as you probably know, have mutations in P53 because P53 is the guardian of the genome. The idea is that you, know, you have double hits and that you make it 15 hits. You'd have to have 15 simultaneous mutations in the same cell. Um, maybe we'll not be able to eliminate it, but we'll be able to make it incredibly rare. That would be cool. <laughs> Thank you for your optimism. <laughs>
Hello, Father. Yes. Um, two questions. First, would you know the difference between um, enhancement that is therapeutic and enhancement that is non-therapeutic? And then two, I'm a biology student. My professor actually is here. Um, what I'm wondering is how do you as a Catholic and even as a member of the clergy um, deal with being a scientist and want to accept science and be truly scientific and not anti-science and yet also consider your faith and what we believe? Okay, so I'll answer the first first. Um, uh, the distinction between enhanced Enhancement, enhancing enhancements and therapeutic enhancements um, is, is going to be slippery at some level. I think at, it's easy to talk about things like um, HIV, genetic immunizations against HIV AIDS. The difficulty is some people will say that being short is a health risk. And so we should all start being tall. And I know some people who are really tall, well, they'll say it's, especially when they, after a long transatlantic flight, they'll say, it's really bad to be tall. It actually hurts me. It's bad against my health. So you see, one of the difficulties is that health is a fluid category. And you could imagine where arguments are made, where it becomes gray, because what you're actually saying is that there are features of the human organism within the natural range that are in fact maybe not deleterious health-wise, but are not as advantageous in the, in the culture we have. And then you would have the cultural versus the biological to deal with. So first one. Second, um, I'm a Dominican. I'm a geek for God. And um, one of the things that I've discovered as a molecular biologist as well as a theologian is that um, Doing science is like going into an incredible art gallery. And each one of those genes is a portrait. And I get a chance to look at this portrait, figure it out, and through the portrait, figure out the painter, you know, the triune god. And so my students, so I go to the AACR meeting. I go to, next week we go to Bari, Italy, because I have to attend the 12th International Meeting for Yeast Apoptosis, which is the meeting for my field. And every time I go dressed like this, it freaks people out. <laughs> and um, I have, you know, my students forget that their PI is a priest. So we'll go into meetings. So a couple weeks, a month ago, we were at the AACR. I won't wear this for the AACR. I wear my blacks, because a lot of people think I'm KKK. Um, you know, last summer there was a problem at, the, at Purdue where they thought that one of my Dominican brothers was walking around. This was his whip. And they actually, this was his whip. And so he was in the cafeteria getting something to eat before he went to the chaplaincy like this one. And there was a lockdown <laughs> because they thought there was a um, KKK member on campus. So when I, so when I go, because it's Bari, Italy, I will wear white, but usually when I go to secular scientific conferences, I wear my clerics. And my students, get, they forget that their PI is a, um, is a priest, a Catholic priest, because when we go in, you know, it'll be very interesting. They will, people will come like, who's that priest you're hanging out with? And um, they'll be like, well, oh, that's Father Nick. He's the PI. And they will always say, second question, does he believe in evolution? Second question. Everywhere I go, I get that. And they'll say, oh, yeah. And, um, and, and they'll ask my students, like, why? Why does he believe in, a, in evolution? And they'll, they're ready with this answer because they get it so often. They'll say, well, he told us it's because the data is really good. <laughs> right? And um, it's really good. And when I, go to, when I go to conferences and I go to poster sessions, I'll be going. There's a, this happened once. I don't remember which meeting. I was going, there was a Drosophila biologist, and all of a sudden, you know, she goes, hello, father, I study Drosophila. It's a fly. If you put a banana out, the fly comes. And I said, where's your loading control for this? And she's like, oh, wow, you know? And, and um, what ends up happening is like, they, you, they always want to figure out the pedigree. they like, where did you go? And you go, MIT. You went to MIT? Like, what happened? This is always like, what happened? <laughs> And I always say, I met, I met my savior at MIT on the 7th of May. It was the worst, craziest thing. It was the, changed my life forever in a place very much like this, you know? And, and they're like, what? And so what's really striking is um, 
I've met, so when I go to meetings, what has happened is you got people who just don't believe. They think I'm strange. Um, when I write for NIH grants, my grants officer, we have to write a very a, a letter that accompanies the NIH grant because I request zero salary. And um, the study section points out they have never, ever received a grant proposal where the PI's contribution is zero. So I have to explain that I have a vow of poverty, blah, 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 blah. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to be a Catholic priest doing molecular biology. Um, but I, I, as a whole for you can see, it's, it's one reality. It's one creation. And he has given us the ability, faith and reason. You know, So this is the golden lecture for faith and science. Both of them, as, as, as Pope John Paul II, now John Paul the Great, he would say, they are left lung and right lung. And you need both to breathe. And for me, what you need to do is you, need, you, have, you have to have a sound philosophy to bring them in conversation. Because if you're not careful, if you're not careful, you have categories in, in science that look like categories in theology or vice versa. And you need a language to do the translation. And because I'm a Dominican, St. Thomas Aquinas provides an incredibly sophisticated framework in which I can do the translation between my science and my theology and philosophy. So for, so for example, one of the things that I do right now, the big burning questions, especially amongst uh, my friends who are evangelicals, is how to deal with Adam and Eve. It's, a very, it's an incredibly pressing problem. There are a lot of evangelicals who are losing their young people because they go to university and they, they feel they have to be forced to choose between um, their faith and their science. And, and they'll say, obviously, science is true. Obviously, science is true. So, so what actually happens is that I, I work with BioLogos. BioLogos is an evangelical uh, foundation that was founded by Francis Collins, the director of the NIH to bring science and theology into conversation. Now, what happens is our Protestant brothers and sisters don't have as sophisticated a philosophical tradition as the Catholic tradition for theological reasons, which I can get into. But what happens is they're so struck by what St. Thomas can contribute to the conversation so that they will be able to talk about, for example, the biological species concept which we assume defines our kind is actually nominalistic. And once you, once you realize that's nominalistic, you can understand how you can take the current models of the genesis of the human species. For example, out of Africa model, 10,000 mating individuals, 5,000 mating pairs, 100,000, 150,000 years ago, 60,000 years ago spread out of Africa. You can now start talking about that in ways that make um, a gene pool coherent with the account of Genesis. And I've actually proposed, based on the bilinguistic program coming out of MIT, my alma mater, that you can still coherently talk about an atom, even within this pool, because this atom would be that individual who acquired a genetic mutation that allowed him, because of alterations in the architecture of his cognitive structures, allow him to develop what Noam Chomsky and the biolinguistic program called the capacity for merge. It's what allows us to speak in a hierarchical and a nonlinear form. And, I'd, and, and Noam Chomsky is very clear. This happened in one person. And we know it happened in one person because every single human being today is able to learn every other single language that we've spoken. It might be tough. It's, Greek was tough. Latin was tough when I had to go through the, the seminary because I'm a molecular biologist and I had to read Latin and Greek. I know it's tough, but it's doable. And one of the things is that we now know that our brains are pretty much structured for human language in similar ways, if not identical ways. And so we know that there are genetics that, is, that, that, that uh, under, underlie this commonality. And there had to be a single genetic mutation to give rise to this capacity. And so I'm actually in the, in the middle of uh, pr proposing that this is a way that you can reconcile an atom, a historical atom, with the very best that paleogenomics can, can tell us. So hopefully that will answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Copies of his book are for sale out here, and I'm sure he'd be happy to sign them or answer a few other questions for you. And there's also coffee out in the hallway. Please join us. <laughs>